the decision has been made about the future of a senior councillor who failed to declare his involvement in the Trojan horse massacre more than 30 years ago. Three youngsters were shot and killed during the apartheid operation in Athlone in the Cape Flats. Sam Pinar has until today to respond and provide reasons why he should not be suspended. On the pain trail, although no date has yet been set, the election machinery is beginning to grind. The DA commands the little track record. She was voted the world's best mayor in 2013. Ultimately, she's been a strong fighter against corruption. That a total of 484 employees were dismissed from the city of Cape Town between 2011 and 2014 for various transgressions, including corruption, unethical and dishonest conduct and theft. So we've certainly acknowledged her history, we've acknowledged her contribution. And she's clear about future priorities. We've always been working as the city. We didn't look at black, white or colored areas. We deliver more than 67% of our budget to poor people. Um, I know we've been accused of delivering services in um, and, and white areas. Delil's dismissed the claims that was Cape part Town of the planning, the a matter he apparently failed to disclose. He hasn't been as suspended as yet. The process is taking place. Uh, Councillor Pinar's um, uh, re uh, relationship with the Trojan horse event uh, was completely unknown to the DA. Um, he uh, didn't disclose it in his declaration when he became a councillor. It was in this street more than 30 years ago where three young people were shot and killed by members of the African Defence Unit. Now residents believe it's an injustice that a commander involved in the massacre is a member of the city council. Having worked on the Trojan Horse Memory Project and on a, a project called If Trees Could Speak, I also think that out of all those people, Sam Pinar might be the one who I think himself experienced loss of a child. It's not right. He should not be allowed to hold any post. It's unfair in the end. Um, he shouldn't be serving and he should be jailed. Meanwhile, the ANC in the city claims the DA was aware of the matter. What is clear is that more and more DA leaders are being exposed as being racist and having acted consciously against our people in the past. Pinar is one example that's come out through the TRC, but it was public knowledge about his involvement. The DA says the councillor has been given until today to respond and provide reasons why he should not be suspended. The Institute for Justice and Reconciliation says Pinar has no place holding public office. Spokesperson Stanley Henkerman says Pinar did not apologize or receive amnesty for his role in the 1985 shootings. Carmel Lochmerg Roberts, SABC News, Cape Town. Well, we apologize for that technical glitch. The battle lines have been drawn in the mother city ahead of the local government elections. The DA has announced that the incumbent mayor, Patricia DeLille, will be the face in its election campaign. The official opposition in the province, the ANC, is still pondering whether to pronounce a mayoral candidate. Parties are preparing for the campaign trail. Although no date has yet been set, the election machinery is beginning to grind. The DA commands the little track record. She was voted the world's best mayor in 2013. Ultimately, She's been a strong fighter against corruption, that a total of 484 employees were dismissed from the city of Cape Town between 2011 and 2014 for various transgressions, including corruption, unethical and dishonest conduct and theft. So we've certainly acknowledged her history, we've acknowledged her contribution. And she's clear about future priorities. We've always been working as the city. We didn't look at black, white or colored areas. We deliver more than 67% of our budget to poor people. Um, I know we've been accused of delivering services in um, and, and white areas. Delil's dismissed claims that Cape Town is the most racist city in the country. She says according to the Human Rights Commission, more racism complaints are reported in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal. She says the city will be distributing millions of pamphlets to fight racism. 
The ANC hopes to regain control of the city they lost in 2006. It is that uh, projected strategy of the ANC that matters. However, we do know there is a possibility in some strategic areas, like Cape Town, uh, where we possibly must discuss the potential of putting up um, a candidate. Ordinary citizens have high expectations. The mayor that I expect, you know, is somebody that is, you know, serving the people that's honest and, you know, transparent. You know, that's not lying to the people, that they're telling the people straightforward. I think a mayor that'll just kind of bring people together, unity, um, and, you know, just, yeah, like I said, unity, I guess, you know, somebody will you know, make people gel. Other big players in the province like the EFF and Hope say their national leaders will be the face of their campaigns. Ulilani Philip, SABC News, Cape Town. While well, sticking with politics, earlier on I was at the ANC's first Lihutla of the Year, where the state of the economy is taking centre stage. Two reports on the economy will be tabled at the three-day meeting. The documents come amid a weak rent, slow economic growth, and now an onslaught from COSATU over the Tax Amendment Act. Education and the upcoming elections will also feature promptly at the meeting. The contents of the State of the Nation Address are drafted here. And on the 11th of February, many will be listening closely to the president when he reads the economic chapter. Especially in light of the rand hitting record lows, trading as much as 18 rand against the US dollar. While the International Monetary Fund downgraded the country's economic growth prospects from 1.3% to 0.7. We are going to debate the economy and the approach to the economy. That's why we are receiving two reports. The first one is an input from the Treasury which will be looking into the fiscal aspects of government of governance and will receive another report from Rob Davis which will look into international economic situation including trade relations listening attentively to those reports will be Kosatu but its biggest challenge now is getting the tax amendment act repealed workers have been in an economic squeeze for ages we acknowledge the dire straits situation right now. We all have to stand together to fix the economy. We must stop making careless mistakes. We must ensure that we close ranks as a nation to face with this economic situation. Ratings agencies Standard & Poor's also warned that the country can't afford any policy errors. However, the door of discussion remain open. We must clarify if the issue is about preservation or not. That debate should take place because if we say no preservations, uh, the experience tells us that that is a life sentence on poverty. Kusat is also taking the fight to the streets, but it's a tight race against time. The Tax Amendment Act will be implemented from the 1st of March. Aldrin Simpia, SABC News, Irene Centurion. And tensions remain high in Injanga, west of Durban, following clashes among ANC members which claimed two lives and left several other people wounded yesterday. Additional police have been deployed to the area. A family in mourning. 68-year-old Philip Lamini was hit by a stray bullet. A confrontation by ANC members at a party meeting turned into a deadly shootout. Lamini's family is battling to come to terms with his death. We are not a cell. He was the only elder left in our family. We relied on him for everything. Whatever problem I had, I went to him. It's over now. I don't know what to do. Local ANC supporters say the situation is volatile and called on party leaders to intervene. We don't know whether that can be characterized as a political violence or political confrontation or it was just purely criminal elements. But we believe that both of those are playing uh, openly at this juncture mm -hmm. because uh, obviously the ANC has to come in and pronounce itself on those. Leadership battles have caused major divisions and resulted in numerous protests. ANC leaders say they are aware of frictions in the area. We were aware as well that there was a problem in the world because one member of the PEC was shot just before the World Conference. But we are not saying the issues are related. We are just waiting for the police to do a direct investigation on both events. Police continue to monitor the area. No arrests have been made. 
Ayanda Mtlongo, SABC News, Nchanga. The long-running investigation into the so-called rogue spy unit at the South African Revenue Services has finally been completed. SARS has confirmed that the auditing firm KPMG, appointed early last year to probe the matter, has now handed over its final report to SARS Commissioner Tom Moyani. The spy saga wreaked havoc at SARS throughout last year after media reports emerged alleging that senior SARS executives had established an, Ill an illicit in intelligence unit, this allegedly to spy on ANC leaders, including President Jacob Zuma, in the lead-up to the bitterly contested ANC elective conference in Bulukwan in 2007. The SARS executives fingered in the matter denied the claims, but most of them, including former SARS Deputy Commissioner Ivan Pillay, have since resigned from the Revenue Service. SARS is keeping mum about the contents of the KPMG report. I wish to confirm that KPMG has submitted its report to SARS and the Commissioner, Mr. Tom Moyane, is looking into it and will decide on what steps to follow. It's still a mixed bag on campuses. Registrations proceeded smoothly at the Mahikeng campus of the, no of the Northwest University. But outsourcing must fall campaigners shut down all administration services at the Tswana University of Technology's main campus. The movement successfully negotiated workers' demands at the University of Pretoria in UNISA. Fighting for workers. Those at TUT want a 10,000 rand monthly salary and permanent employment with full benefits, among other things. A memorandum of demands was handed to university management. There should be normals in the university starting from tomorrow. But if they are going to uh, play delaying tactics, they must be prepared uh, because we are prepared also to go for two weeks in this uh, demonstration. At Northwest University, registrations for first-year students continued uninterrupted. The registration process was disturbed or disrupted last Monday and then we had to resort to a court order uh, to prevent students from any disruptions, further disruptions on the campus. Um, and in that regard, um, we then actually also decided then to, to um, uh, do all our registrations online. And it went actually very well. Um, as on Friday, the latest statistics that we had is that more than 2,000, uh, say 200 approximately students did register online. The campus is implementing a ministerial directive on the use of NSFAS funds to settle student debt from 2013 to 2015. Student leaders are also doing their bid to assist needy students. They want to raise one million rand by the end of February. It's a crisis that we, 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 we find ourselves faced with year in year out on our campus because uh, it is very sad for us to see our brothers and sisters being financially excluded from the system of the university. The SRC hopes to assist over 3,000 students. Margit Amtabe, SABC News. And workers have been urged not to resign from work or take early retirement because of the in, or take early retirement because of the retirement insurance reforms. This is a plea from the National Education, Health and Allied Workers Union Nehau. It held a briefing in Johannesburg today. Earlier this month, President Jacob Zuma signed into law the 2015 Taxation Laws Amendment Bill, which affects the tax treatment of retirement funds. Dissatisfaction is mounting over the retirement insurance reform. Nehau says there was no consultation at NEDLEC. Therefore, it stands with COSATU and is calling for the law to be scrapped. Workers should not resign. Uh, workers should uh, uh, trust in the unions uh, and their power uh, to fight this uh, uh, struggle that we are now uh, uh, embarking on. The union added its voice to an end to outsourcing at universities, asked how a balance could be struck between sustainable business practices and worker rights. Soike says the union's priority is the livelihood of workers. There are um, uh, aspirant uh, entrepreneurs who want to establish themselves as business people and so on. Uh, we think that um, uh, grabbing uh, outsourcing will not be the right way uh, of building 
a concrete um, business which rely on a three months contract or a three year contract and after a three year contract then that business is given to somebody else uh, at the exploitation of workers. Nehau has welcomed the publication of the white paper on the national health insurance. It has called on workers and communities to support its implementation. Diabo Seyton, SABC News, Johannesburg. The state has filed an affidavit opposing Oscar Pistorius' bid to appeal his murder conviction in the Constitutional Court. The state says it's in the interest of justice that the athlete be sentenced for the crimes he committed and that his appeal arguments are without merit. In December, the Supreme Court of Appeal changed Pistorius' culpable homicide conviction to one of murder. Two weeks ago, the athlete's lawyers applied for leave to appeal, arguing that the appeals court had acted unlawfully and unconstitutionally. Pistorius faces a minimum of 15 years for the murder of his model girlfriend, Riva Stienkamp, three years ago. He is expected to be back in court on April the 18th for sentencing. The NPA says it's confident that Pistorius' Concord bid will fail. If, if you peruse our papers, you'd, uh, it would become clear that uh, they do not really have a leg to, to stand on. That is um, our position, uh, that the SCA was, was correct in upholding our appeal. Our appeal was on a point of law, not uh, on facts. Therefore, that is why we were confident that uh, the, 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 the Concord would not uh, grant them access. Well, those are some of the stories we will be tracking for you this week. Time now for a quick break. When we return, King Goodwill Zolitini says he will not apologize for his utterances regarding foreign nationals. We take a look at this in detail when we return. Don't go away. Crafted chocolate stout made to be savored responsibly by people over the age of 18. We know you're out there, silently waiting for your spot in the limelight. Step up, people of the party. We need your energy, your greatness. Just because you don't do it for money doesn't make you an amateur. Yes, we salute you, party comrade, with a bottle of Johnny Walker Red Label for just $169.99 from Tops at Spa. Well, King Goodwill Zolitini says he will not apologize for his utterances regarding foreign nationals. The king was responding to recommendation in the preliminary report by the Human Rights Commission. The report is believed to have exonerated the king from hate speech, but recommended that he apologize. Zolitini spoke at the commemoration of the Battle of Isandlawana at Tungutu at the weekend. He ruled out an apology. In his controversial speech to police chiefs at Pongola last year, the king said foreigners committing crime should leave the country. 31 complainants lodged a case with the Human Rights Commission. It was claimed that his remarks amounted to hate speech, sparking xenophobic attacks in the country. The commission's preliminary report was released late last year and sent for comments to the complainants and the respondents. <laughs> Today the Human Rights Commission says there was nothing wrong with my utterance, yet they want me to apologize. They don't tell me why I should apologize when I am found not guilty. In my culture, we don't just apologize for no reason. The king insisted he was wrongly quoted. Last year there were a lot of attacks from the media. The country was nearly close to turmoil because of lies that were reported about my utterance in Pongolo last year. Complainants are said to be unhappy with the preliminary report and may seek intervention from the Equality Court. The Commission won't comment until the final report, expected at the end of the month. Lungisukumalo, SAPC News, Ngutu. 
Well, joining us for tonight's debate, we have Tutuga Ndebele from the Institute of Race Relations and analyst Professor Lisi Batifo. Uh, gentlemen, thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. Professor, let me start with you first. Are you all surprised that the king doesn't want to apologize or doesn't see the need to apologize? Why should he? As the recommendation so from the High Commission. Yeah, but uh, what was it about? What was the inquiry about? There were complaints lodged. Uh, there were utter utterances attributed to the king. To the king. And um, if you look at the history of this saga, you would recall that the matter was also presented to, the, to parliament by Advocate Mushana, who did indicate there were threats to the employees of the Human Rights Commission. There were also statements made by Mem Bengu that it is not worth pursuing this matter. There were statements made as per research and documents that I perused even today that Dr. Matole Mutsekha mm -hmm. says the matter is exhausted. So there were more forces at work that certainly influenced the outcome or the recommendations. Hence the people unhappy. And uh, given that contradiction, I would understand why the king would say, why should I apologize? Because you, you suggest or implicit in that is that he's guilty, yet you say he's not guilty. Are you then suggesting that um, the way or the manner in which the High Commission went about investigating this saga, it didn't do it to the T according to the principles and the values of the High Commission and what's um, in the preamble of the Constitution as well? To start with, uh, the Human Rights Commission told us that the King's utterances were inconsistent with the values that underpin the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. That's what they told us. That they told us that advices to the contrary notwithstanding, they were to go ahead with the investigation, for they believed it was worth their while. That's one. Two, if you go through the literature and the records up to, day, up to date, it will indicate to you that there was unnecessary and undue delay in this regard. And it is that that would make the complainants worry all the more. And if there are avenues to which they can appeal, I certainly think they would. Tutugan, let me bring it in here as well. Are you at all surprised by the King's response as well, considering um, the findings of um, the, the Human Rights Commission? I, I, I think to a large extent I'd have to agree with the Professor, because um, one of the basic tenets of, tenets of law is that it, there has to be certainty. So if, if there wasn't certainty about whether the king had been found guilty or not, then it would be a bit of a problem because now how does he then come out and apologize if he has not been found guilty, some, some people would say in court. So it's, 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 it, it, if, if he were to come out and apologize and all that, I think the Human Rights Commission would have to set it out uh, uh, plainly and, you know, in, 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 in the most understandable language to say he has been found um, guilty if that were the word to use and then you'd have to apologize. I, 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 I see it that way. Well, the professor says that, um, or he asks rather, what should he be apologizing for? And that's the same question. Um, that the king asks as well. He says, why, why should I apologize if I haven't been found guilty of anything? However, though, what the report says is that his utterances were hurtful and harmful. Isn't that the reason enough to apologize? Well, I think um, it depends on how you look at it. If, if, if it's from a point of view of, um, you know, in, in, in most instances, we would see it as um, uh, that... Uh, you know, you look at it from a point of view that the king uh, has got a lot of influence and therefore um, the average person would listen to what he says and think of it as um, some form of authority. So um, I think from, you know, if, if, if we were to see it that way, it would be that um, the king would take uh, some sort of, a, you know, a, a, a bigger person approach and say, um, I apologize for this because I may have 
um, not realize that the average person would um, uh, you know take my comments in a different context mm. but but of course it's 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 contested that his utterances would have caused um, whatever else happened after that. Pro Professor Tifa, wouldn't it then be in the interest probably of social cohesion as well? Um, and um, thinking of those who complained during the xenophobic violence, and of course they've cast aspersions on the king, that the king, as, 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 as uh, Tutugani says, should come out and be the bigger person and apologize. <coughs> yes, you see, th th there wouldn't be a problem with that. If we, and I think he did, if there is a misinterpretation of what I've said, then I regret and I apologize. But due process was followed. And the conclusion thereof, remember, the, 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 one of the obligations or the duties of the Human Rights Commission is that it must promote and protect human rights. Yes. And where there is violation thereof, they must seek rec recourse, or they must at least get re redress of one sort um, of some sort or another. In this instance, they are saying you have to apologize. Implicit in that, we have found you guilty, but we don't have the courage to articulate that. Mm -hmm. And indirectly, perhaps the king is saying, I'm forcing you to say, indeed, I'm at fault, and I must apologize. Logic dicta dictates accordingly. All right, let me go to, to, to Tigani. I think I, I, I hear what he's saying, that the king could say, can I meet them halfway, look for the golden mean, mm -hmm. and say, and be adult enough to say, all right, um, the misunderstandings notwithstanding, I concede that there might have been some in, misinterpretation and attendant uh, consequences or violence, and I apologize for that without taking responsibility and liability. But in the interest of nation building, social cohesion and reconciliation, perhaps that ought, he ought to have been encouraged. And I suspect some people approached him and encouraged him to do that, and he did that then. But subsequent to that, we went through this process. It is unfortunate that this comes out of the Human Rights Commission in the main, headed by men and women who know the law who know exactly that you cannot pronounce a judgment based not on premises. And it must follow from those premises logically so that it can be acceptable and at least st uh, stand the legal master. And we just have to point out that the Human Rights Commission has been quite reluctant to do interviews on, um, on this story because this is the preliminary report um, that they've issued. But Professor, here's the other thing, is that doesn't the Human Rights Commission run the risk of um, a precedent being set, for instance, where you have such findings that come out and there is this recommendation and the recommendation quite clearly is being ignored by, by, by the king who has a great stature within the country in terms of his political stance here in South Africa? I, I, I want to maintain this point. I, I would say he has defied them if they had found him guilty. They haven't. They can only go down on their knees to request him to apologize, but not based on logic and not flowing from the recommendations because the recommendations are inconsistent with what transpired. And the, the king to that extent is okay. But let's go to, Nana, to, to the second part of that question. The Human Rights Commission, I also must concede, is a besieged institution because it makes recommendations. Remember, in 2008, we had a major upheaval in xenophobia. An investigation was conducted by Human Rights Commission. It was submitted to Parliament. To date, Parliament has not implemented those recommendations. It is Parliament itself that is undermining a Chapter 9 institution. I mentioned two senior members of Parliament who themselves sat in Parliament Stop this investigation. It's not worth your while. Yet I, we all know. But I guess as, as fellow South Africans, they have an opinion as well, which uh, unfortunately or fortunately, they find themselves in Parliament and they've got access um, to the Human Rights Commission. So if they feel that this is not an investigation um, with, with following up on, then that's the case. And look at the outcome of this investigation, for instance. Yes, the outcome of this investigation, as I say, is unfortunate and inconsistent with logic and the law. 
That's what I'm saying. And by, at the same time, I'm sympathetic to them because I think they are besieged, right? It's an organization under threat and being undermined, not only by ordinary citizens like you and me, but even those who have take, taken the vow or the oath of office to uphold the Constitution. It, when it, they say, thou shalt not investigate, yet at the same time they know that it's not supposed to be the case. Then it's unfortunate. To, 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 let me bring you in here. What message do you think is then sent here? If I'm a complainant and I go to the Human Rights Commission, and let's make an example with um, this recent case of Penny Sparrow. I'm sure the Human Rights Commission has received several complaints with regards to that, the, just that single case. Yes. What level of confidence do you then inspire when you have Professor Tifoyer who speaks um, quite little of the Commission as, uh, 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 on its current standing? Well, I think it, it takes a little bit more understanding because um, what are the powers of the Human Rights Commission? I think um, just like all the other Chapter 9 institutions, the, the public protector, um, the auditor general and so on, um, the, the, the Human Rights Commission is going just to make recommendations. And, and I think we need to understand where their, uh, you know, their power ends. Um, like, like the professor said, they are, they are also a, a besieged institution. So I think also of um, that there's, there's also another um, way out. Uh, I think the Human Rights Commission is able um, at, at, at this point or uh, another in future to you know, approach the Equality Court if, if they see fit and um, the courts can take it from there. Well, I guess that's another topic that we need to discuss when we come back from the short ad break. And that's the powers of um, the Human Rights Commission. We continue with tonight's conversation when we return. Stay with us. The big news is Newsroom. We also stream live on YouTube. Whether you're at home, at the office or at the gym, wherever you are, Newsroom is right there with you. Bringing you all the latest news, updates, sports, weather and everything in between. Get all the latest news you need on the go via live streaming on our YouTube channel. That's Newsroom, weekdays at 9am, only on the SABC News Channel. In Africa, technology has created many new ways of doing things. ICT is an increasingly important part of everybody's life. It's being used in education, for social media, and now for farming too. The best thing about internet for a farmer is that we get to share information. On Network, we give you all the important African technology and social media news. That's Network with me, Pomele Lezondi, every Sunday at 7.30pm Central African Time, only on SABC News. Welcome back. We are still in studio with our guest um, tonight, uh, Tutugan Indebele and uh, Professor Lisi Badifo. Um, uh, Tutugan, let's first start off with where we ended just before the break, and that is um, the powers of the Human Rights Commission. Yes. Um, you know, basically, uh, like the other Chapter 9 institutions, uh, as envisaged by the Constitution, the Human Rights Commission can make recommendations, but it cannot you know, um, enforce those. So uh, in an instance where they would feel that it's, it's, uh, it's important to carry on with um, uh, any particular issue at hand, then they, they would have the option, I suppose, of um, approaching the Equality Court, which um, would then, you know, I think follow the process of um, what, you know, any other court would do. Uh, pr pr professor, when you, when you look at um, what's currently happening at the Human Rights Commission, as you say, um, it is an institution that is besieged. What do you think should happen now? Do you think that um, the teeth of the Human Rights Commission should be sharpened or actually they should have get more teeth? 
we, we can sharpen them. We can give them more teeth by merely respecting. Remember, you can legislate, but if the people themselves are not ready and willing to ensure that the law is upheld, then uh, it doesn't help us all. I think of somebody called Martin Luther King Jr., who once said, we must try to live together lest we perish together as fools. It almost sounds the, like you've given up on the institution. I, I haven't. I, 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 I've given up on those who have the moral and the legal duty, especially those in the hallowed building called Parliament, who are undermining Chapter 9 institutions. Listen to Advocate Mushwana. He says, I made recommendations in 2009. My Parliament, to which I report, has not, 10 years down the line, implemented those. Listen to the members of parliament undermining him and even discouraging him from carrying out his work. Surely my sympathies go to Advocate Mushan and the Human Rights Commission. Let's, let's, let, let's, let us not set them up for failure. Let us not under, undermine them. I'm not speaking only for the Human Rights Commission. I'm speaking for all Chapter 9 institutions. And speaking about the Chapter 9 institutions, uh, Tutugani, we've seen what happened with the public protector as well. There are several mm. cases that have gone all the way up to the Supreme Court of Appeal, and now we have um, the Nkandla saga that's also going to be tested at the Constitutional, uh, at the constitutional Court of, around the powers of the public protector. Does this then mean that every other Chapter 9 institution, when they make recommendations, those recommendations are not, are not fulfilled, then what happens? Does that mean that we then need to resolve and go to a court and let the court have the final say? We also spoke about the Equality Court earlier on. Well, um, unfortunately, even when the, the courts get involved, in some, in some instances you, will, you might find that um, the decisions of the courts may not necessarily be you know, respected. But um, it's, it's, it's encouraging to, to say, um, you know, the recent case of the Abatembu king, um, he, you know, you know um, got to the point where he uh, went to prison. So um, I, I, I wouldn't really say it's, it's completely a case of, the, uh, of, of you know, uh, uh, the courts being ignored and... Uh, uh, you know, due process not being followed. I, I, I'm a bit optimistic in that sense. Uh, Professor Tifo, just before we wrap up, just some closing remarks um, with regards to this discussion that we're having today. Well, look, I think let me just let you on to what Tutukani said. There is a pattern of late of st State Department not abiding by the judge the court decisions, not implementing them, not taking advice. And that culture we must discourage because at one stage we might find that as a nation we have reached a point whereby nobody is going to respect the law. If, if state departments don't do that, right, we have no reason to hope for, for a better tomorrow. But that notwithstanding, I'm a victim of hope and I think uh, the more we share, as concerned uh, South Africans, patriots, trying to fashion a new tomorrow, uh, perhaps we'll find each other, and the ways we utter may find home and solace in those who are listening, especially the leadership. And actually listening to you there, speaking about um, undermining courts as well, um, the story that came to mind is um, the Omar al-Bashir story when he was here in the country and we know for, um, um, as the AU summit kicks off in Addis Ababa um, that he will be attending as well and many people will be looking quite closely as to what those head of states will be doing that side. Will they hand him over? But chances are that it will not, it will not happen. <laughs> yes, as much as you and I know. I mean, uh, if anything... Um, it was uh, the AU that said South Africa shall not do that, and South Africa never failed the AU, and uh, that's fine. Um, I think uh, it's a moot point, because um, South Africa at the time can argue that it was not South Africa. Remember, at one stage, the precinct of the AU and the precinct of the United Nations become a different, it becomes a juristic person in and by itself. So that's a debate of of some sort, yes, South Africa should have acted, 
as advice given the Rome Statute. On that alone, I think we made a mistake. But there are many more examples, even on minor matters, where our de departments don't really respect the court judgments. And what, uh, what about a small man who tomorrow is not going to do that? Who's going to have the moral authority to advise on the rule of law? If those who have taken the, at least the oath of office don't do that. And Tutugan, just bringing you in here, um, the, 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 the debate of the day started off with obviously the issues around um, the, 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 the king, uh, King Zelitini, and um, the foreign nationals, those who have laid the complaints, those who feel that they were hurt during the xenophobic violence, those who cast aspersions and blame, and blame um, um, the king, what message do we have for those people? Or what message is being sent to those people? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a bit difficult in the sense that um, you would have to rely on precedent, I suppose, to, to say, okay, the, w this has happened before and we have dealt with it in this manner. But um, uh, I, I, currently you cannot, you cannot really say that um, you, you can, <coughs> you know, assure people that, uh, you know, that things will be okay because um, the signs are that uh, this is a matter that will die a natural death. Okay, well, perfect. Um, that was uh, Tutugan Indebele joining us from the Institute of Race Relations as well as uh, Professor Lee C. Batifo, thank you so much for your time, gentlemen. And uh, let's hope that this discussion will also continue at home. And remember that you can get um, this footage, if you want to watch this program again, you can get it on YouTube as well as uh, let's make sure that this discussions continue on uh, Twitter as well as uh, social media as well. It's now time for a quick ad break and uh, don't go away. Good afternoon, you're watching the Midday Report. Lunchtime news amplified. But for now, this is what they call home. Their hope to shift to a higher ground seems to be against the tide. Midday Report provides you with more than just news stories. I just want Port Elizabeth to know that they own a world-class theatre. Good afternoon, you're with the news at one in the headlines. Very good afternoon to you. This is News Live. I'm Natasha Thorpe. Let's take a quick look at what's coming up in your headlines. Good afternoon and welcome to A View from the House. For all things news, tune in to Midday Report weekdays at 12 noon only on the SABC News Channel. Well, Mondays have taken on a texture, a new texture since former President Thabo Mbeki decided to release weekly letters reflecting, of reflecting on his time in the presidency. In this week's edition, Mbeki says he never fired the then deputy ANC president, Jacob Zuma. He says Zuma offered to step down to focus on a court case and to clear his name. As it was put in 2005, the release of then president Jacob Zuma from his responsibilities sent shockwaves across the country. He was implicated in the corruption trial of his former financial advisor, Shabir Sheikh. As President of the Republic, I've come to the conclusion that the circumstances did dictate that in, in the interest of the Honorable Deputy President, the government, our young democratic system and our country, it would be best to release Honorable Jacob Zuma from his responsibilities as Deputy President of the Republic and member of the cabinet. Mbeki's letters have elicited wide reaction. Some say he's neither doing himself nor the ANC a favor. What, what is very interesting about Mr. Mbeki's letters is how polarizing they are once again. Uh, if you participate in debates on this issue, if you look at what people are saying, uh, it really is polarizing people. People either think that Mr. Mbeki was a national hero or they think he was a disaster. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting that South Africans should be so divided and so polarized are, are, are about uh, our, our, our second president. 
The ANC. Mbeki also dismissed allegations that he had centralized power by controlling the ANC from the union buildings. He said cabinet appointments and reshuffling were always done in consultation with the ANC. The office of the president refused to comment on Beggy's third letter. Muntlenyani di Poku, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, depending on who you speak to about um, former President Tabon Beki's decision to start releasing these letters, some say that, why? Why now? The other question is, even when you look through these letters, there, there are aspersions that are cast. Certain people are being told that they are the ones that were behind this campaign, but the former president doesn't release the names of those people. And I remember speaking to uh, Max, who is the CEO of the Tabon Becky Foundation, saying that the, pre the former president decided that he wants to correct all the untruths of um, history or what has, what, what has been told about him that is totally untrue. So that will be running for the next 10 weeks, if I'm not mistaken. We'll be getting more um, letters from Tabo Mbeki. I know, for instance, that the Zimbabwe, the decision uh, that uh, the country took on Zimbabwe will also be released. They will also write on that. And there is the other report as well, which will be on um, the Tabo Mbeki's stance on HIV AIDS. For now, let's take a quick break. And after this, we will be back. Are you saying the king must go to jail? You are not uh, royal blood, uh, therefore you are going to save time on behalf of the king. Where does the public protector stand on this matter? Are you with the marches, for the marches, against the march? If this is your ancestor, it is very much his ancestor as well, because this is the cradle of uh, humankind. Is there God somewhere in your science? Drinking the blood of a person with albinism gives extra magical powers. A man of the cloth is involved here because it would mean that somehow religion is being brought into this part of the myth. What do you say to me? What's question time with me, Mpo Tseidu? Monday to Thursday at 5.30 p.m. on the SABC News Channel. As previously mentioned, the AU will be meeting this week heading into the summit. African countries are being urged to take up existing continental, continental insurance to mitigate against natural disasters. The African Risk Capacity Insurance is an initiative uh, for, of the African Union. This is at a time when Southern Africa in particular is facing the worst drought since 1992. Battling extreme weather conditions, threatening food security and countries' economies, from droughts to flooding, they've become part of the continent's challenges. And the African Risk Capacity ensures countries against severe weather patterns. This is an area where actually Africa is taking the lead. We got a tremendous response from around the world. Because this is an Africa thing controlled by Africans, and Africa is leading the innovation. The fund wants to discourage African countries from relying on foreign donors. That help sometimes arrives too late, with populations starving and livestock already dying. This is what we want to demonstrate, that with our own solutions as Africans, we can start a process of helping the people, even before. It doesn't mean that the World Food Programme, the UN, cannot come in, but we don't have to wait for them, we act ahead of them. South Africa, reading from a prolonged drought, has shown interest. We had a very good meeting with Finance Minister Praveen Gordon at Davos just to talk about the issue of the drought in South Africa, and he was very receptive. Uh, so I think in the case of South Africa, we're hoping that they will come on stream. So far, 26 countries have signed with an agency at an annual fee of $3 million. Lehana Tsotetsi, SABC News. Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Meanwhile, our foreign editor Sophie Mugwena sat down with the chairperson of the Board of African Risk Capacity 
Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Luela, and uh, the chairman of the AFRC, Dr. Lars Tunnel, to unpack this initiative. African Risk Capacity is an agency of the African Union established in 2012. Uh, and it does something very, very important for African countries. Uh, this is an agency that is, has developed an innovative approach to, to helping African countries manage weather-based events. It has done that by establishing the Africa uh, Risk Capacity Limited, uh, which sells insurance policies and Dr. Tunnell will explain in more detail to African countries so that in case of drought and eventually flood and extreme climate events, they will be able to get an insurance payout which they can use immediately to help the affected people. Now, why is this important? In the past, when we have known droughts, floods, what we have is you know, a UN appeal, which we very much appreciate. But then it takes time. And during that time, you see pictures of African children starving, livestock dead, pictures that are not palatable. When we are there waiting for someone else to come and put money together, you know, funds to be donated to help us. Now we said, no, we have to turn this around. Africans have to take charge of their own uh, their own destiny in this regard. They have to develop a mechanism to manage these events. Then the donor funding and the support can come later. And that is what this African risk capacity does. We have developed a database based on, on weather data going back 30 years over little squares all over Africa so we can see how much it had rained. And we're using that, updating that uh, data through satellite now all the time, and, and therefore you can start to see trends, and we can compare that with the historical numbers, and, and uh, therefore you can also do insurance. So what we do based on, on that, we decide what, how, what type of program the government would like to have, they decide that. Would they like to insure themselves against an event every 20 year, every four year, or every 100 year? It's their decision. But, but uh, then we, they pay a premium, and they get insured. And, and then uh, we limited, we reinsure ourselves in the international reinsurance market. So it, this becomes a, a true public-private <coughs> partnership. And it's, it's very innovative, and I think it's, it's, uh, this is an area where actually Africa is taking the lead. We got a tremendous response from around the world. Well, we will be bringing you more from the AU Summit during the course of the week. Big issues that we expect to be tackled right there is the issue around um, Burundi, Pia Nkurunziza's re-election. We know where the AU stance is with regards to that, as well as um, Somali and the tensions in um, Mali as well. We know that the African standby force is expected to be deployed from 2016, from the start of, of 2016. Well, we will wait and see whether the African standby force is ready to be deployed. But that's all we have for you tonight. From me, Aldrin Simpier, and the rest of the team, it's goodbye for now. Good afternoon, you're watching the Midday Report. Lunchtime News Amplified. But for now...